Welcome everybody to this uh, new webinar that we are very pleased to, to present this afternoon. Uh, this webinar is about high-speed uh, single photon detectors for high-speed QKD. And we have two presenters to, uh, to talk about this experiment that was uh, taking place in, um, in the university in Geneva. Uh, this is what we're presenting today is the result of uh, uh, a pretty important uh, project that was run by the University in Geneva in collaboration with the IG Quantique in, in Switzerland. And for this webinar, we have uh, two presenters, uh, Professor Hugus Binden and uh, Dr. Giovanni Resta. Uh, and both of them are going to explain what is this um, experiment about and what kind of results and performance uh, could be obtained. And um, uh, as always, this webinar is going to be recorded and you can watch it later if you didn't have a chance to, to watch it uh, in live uh, today. Uh, before we start, I'd like to introduce the two speakers. And uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome uh, and thank very much Hugo Zbinden for taking the time to, to present uh, his research this afternoon. Um, just to introduce Hugo, Hugo was, uh, uh, has joined the university in Geneva in 93, uh, the group of applied physics, and he has been leading the group of experimental uh, activities since then. Uh, his research has spanned various areas from optical sensors, single photon detectors, quantum communication, and the foundations of quantum mechanics. He was appointed uh, MER, which means Maître d'Enseignement et de Recherche, back in 2003, and um, is an associate professor since 2012. He is also a co-founder of the company ID Quantic in 2001, and he's uh, um, also he has contributed to the development of the uh, commercial uh, quantum cryptography and other quantum technology that have. Uh, resulted in IDQ's product. Um, also, I'd like to introduce Giovanni Resta. He received the master degree in nanotechnology from Politecno di Torino in Italy. Um, he also studied in Grenoble, France, and obtained a PhD degree in microsystems and microelectronics from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne in 2019. Uh, he spent some time at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, JPL uh, of NASA and Caltech in the USA, and worked on superconducting nanowire single photon detectors for deep space optical communication. He's currently an R&D scientist at ID Quantic, and he works on developing superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. So with no uh, further delay, uh, I'd like to uh, hand over to Hugo Spinden, who's going to talk first about QKD uh, in general and more specifically about this research. And then Giovanni is going to take over and, and, and tell you more about the single photon detectors that have been developed specifically to obtain high speed the QKD um, performance. So Oh, one more thing before I hand over to Hugo. There's a, there's a Q&A box available from the Zoom uh, interface. If you have questions, and I hope you, have, you will have questions, please enter your questions using that um, uh, Q&A box, and we will take questions at the end of the presentation. So over to you. OK, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, well, as Mark said, I will. Uh start with a short introduction on QKD. Very, very simply, uh, I, I cannot go into much detail. So QKD, quantum key distribution. So the goal is to distribute a, a key between Alice and Bob, the two users. And uh, this key will then be used to encrypt data. And in a way that is information theoretically secure, that's important. So what are the resources Alice and Bob need in order to do that. So you see this uh, orange boxes. So they need two offices, which are safe. That's, I mean, kind of a basic ingredient of any uh, crypto system. And then the important thing, we have this yellow quantum channel, which allows them to send quantum states. In our case, these are photons. No? 
And then on top of that, there are other things you need. You need random number generators on both sides, and you need an authenticated classical channel. So the procedure is actually quite simple. So Alice sends lots of quantum states to Bob, and Bob measures them and collects, of course, he will not measure all the photons, but collects all the photons he, he arrives. No? And the idea is that if there is an eavesdropper in between, since we, we are working with single photons, a measurement uh, of the eavesdropper would perturb this exchange of photons, and then Alice and Bob can realize that. So for doing this, after this ex exchange, they check for errors they have in this key. So they compare part of this, uh, of this uh, string of bits and look up if there are errors. And in principle, there, if there is no if there are no errors. So of course, in practice, there are always a few errors. They have to apply uh, some error correction to correct this error. And then based on, on the errors they detect, they can calculate the potential information an eavesdropper might have. And they apply a procedure which is called privacy amplification. And this brings this information for eavesdropper down to zero. It shortens a key a bit, but at the end, they end up with a, with a secret key. So this is just the basic principle. Now, how is this implemented? There are different ways to implement that. Maybe you heard about this uh, DB84 protocol invited, invented by Bennett and Brasser in 1984. And we use a, a kind of special version of this protocol. It's called time binding encoding, time bind encoding. So we send bits, no quantum bits. So we have essentially a zero and one we want to send in this C basis. And the way we encode that, we have either a pulse. Uh, in, a, uh, in an early time bin or a pulse in a, in a late time bin. So if it's a late time bin, it's, it's a one, if it's an early one, it's a zero. And now we can send this to Bob, and Bob has here a, a single photon detector and measures the arrival time of these photons, and then he can say if it's zero or, one, or a one. Okay, this allows us to send information. Now, if we just do this, then it wouldn't be safe, no? Because Eve could do exactly the same like Bob and to detect and resend. In order to prevent that, what we have to do, we have the other basics, which is called the X basis. From time to time, we will send a superposition of photon being early and late. And if we send this superposition, a coherent superposition, and if tries to measure the arrival time of the photons, like uh, in a C basis, no? Then she will destroy this coherence between the two pulses. And this loss of coherence, we can detect that at pop if from time to time we send now the pulses into these interferometers where these two pulses here can, well, you see the early pulse we go, can go the long part, the short part, uh, later pulse can go the short, short path here, and then they can interfere. And if the coherence is not broken, we can adjust, for instance, the face such that always this detector here will click. If the coherence is broken, then also the other detector may click. So at the end, it's actually quite simple. Now, whenever we have clicks in this detector here, this is a sign of the presence of the eavesdropper. So this is kind of an alarm. If this detector clicks too much, we know, oh, attention, there is an eavesdropper. That's a bit the idea. So we, we don't use this X basis in order to distribute key. We could do this as well. But in our case, we use essentially a C basis. And then from time to time, we measure in X basis. So in the BB84 protocol, you have also different, in the X basis, two different bases, zero and pi. In our case, actually, we, we make that a bit simpler. We see, we see that here we have this uh, different states, but actually we don't use this because we don't use this X space in order to generate key. We just can use one of these states. So we have only three different states. So uh, plus uh, zero, one, and plus. And 
that's enough to, to generate uh, this keys. Now, there is a little uh, detail I have to add. Since we are using weak coherent pulses, so from time to time, there might be more than one photon in a pulse. And if can if can use that to make a, a, a photon number splitting attack, which is called. And in order to prevent these attacks, uh, what we have to do, we actually modulate the intensity of our pulses. So we have this weak pulse mu with the intensity mu one. From time to time, we send only half of it, mu two. And I, I cannot go in details how exactly this works, but the idea is a bit to trick the eavesdropper. And uh, if the eavesdropper now tries to, to act only on, on, uh, on pulses where we have more than one photon, then she will do that more likely if we use the intensity mu1 than the mu intensity mu2. So if at the end we make a statistic, so the pulses which arise with the different intensities, we can actually tell if this uh, if this eavesdrop make this kind of attack and we can prevent that. This is called this deco decoy state method. Okay, so at the end we have to generate these six different states. And we, what we, we do that we, we, by sending a pulse, we have a pulse laser with a clock at 2.5 gigahertz. We filter the pulses, then we send it in an interferometer, the same way like the BOPS interferometer. And now we have, for each incoming pulse, we have two pulses with a fixed phase relationship. And then we use intensity modulator in order to carve out this pattern here. So we can, with this intense monetary to now generate any of these six different states. We, we send that to, to Bob, and Bob has this to uh, basis, C basis, where it just measures the arrival time, and there's another interferometer here, and, uh, and then she, he, here he measures these clicks in this detector here, which, as I said, we should have as little as possible, and in order to and we have more clicks if there is somebody uh, breaking this coherence between the pulses. Okay, so that's this protocol. And now, uh, quite recently, we make an experiment with this, uh, which was published in this paper here. And we managed to exchange a key uh, above uh, over 400 kilometers, roughly. You know, we see this uh, secret key rate as a function of the distance. And it goes down. This is a logarithmic scale. It goes down exponentially due to the loss in the fiber. And eventually, if uh, the signal becomes too small and starts to uh, be uh, hidden in the noise, then of course the, the secret gate rate goes breaks down. And in this case, we managed to go to 420 kilometers. No? And uh, well, that was at this time. This was the, the, the longest distance ever. Achieved and it's still the longest distance achieved with this kind of protocol. So now, what can we do to improve that? Well, here, by the way, you see the, some points of other experiments which existed before our experiment. So we are quite happy to have this uh, considerable improvement. So now, what can we do? Well, first thing we can do, we can try to make the setup a bit nicer, smaller. So here you see a uh, a part of Alice, like it was in this experiment. And now we would like to integrate that. So that's some, some work we did in China very recently. And eventually we replaced this setup just by this little chip here uh, on, based on silicon photonics. Actually here on this picture, you see the optical chip and it's also an electronic chip on, on, on it. So this helps us a lot to simplify our setup, to make it easier to produce and so on, and eventually also cheap in a cheaper way. Another thing we can do, of course, we still can go, go, try to go further. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, uh, this twin field quantum key distribution is something that was so, suggested a few years ago. And this is a recent experiment last year where people achieved to make under 830 kilometers, which is just a double of what we get in our experiment. And Actually, why it, it can double the distance, you will see that in the next slide, they'll try to explain, they explain to you very, very simply how this works. The idea now in this uh, twin field is actually that you have actually a common source somewhere in the center, and then you send pulses from Alice to Bob, 
uh, to and Alice and Bob and Alice now send weak pulses. They modulate the phase on these pulses to a central station here. So, and this also in a coherent way. So actually, it's a, it's this is a, a huge interferometer. No? And now, if Bob applies a certain phase here, and Alice uh, another one, and he, uh, somebody in the middle announces where he got a click in this detector and this detector, Bob and Alice can figure out what the phase of the other was. No? So we, we, like this, they can uh, distribute the information. No? And now the thing is now do it by doing like this, it's enough that the photon travels half of a way. No? It's a single photon which travels even this path or this path, but from, from here to here, it's only half of a way. So we have only half of a loss. That's mean we can, we can double the distance. This is very nice, no? The idea, I mean, but in practice, it's very, very complicated. I will not tell you how they do that. But of course, it's a, a, an interferometer which is 800 kilometers long. So it's extremely complicated to stabilize that. And this is not something that is, exists commercially. Nowadays, it's too complicated. Okay, another thing you would like to do is to make uh, what we did in our experiment to make it go to higher rates, no? Well, first, let's have a look at the influence of signal photon detectors in QKD. So here you see a, a, a simplified plot of the secret key ray as a function of a distance. And you see how this rate goes down exponentially since we have this loss in the fiber. Until, as I said, no, at some point, the noise of the detector becomes considerable and then uh, the errors are too high and we cannot distill uh, a key anymore. So that at some point, this uh, curve will drop down. And this point here depends on the error rate, essentially on the dark count rate of our detectors. Actually, it, it also, at some point, uh, that's a kind of a detail. We, we have to make a statistic analysis of this uh, of these uh, counts and errors and so on in order to, to, to estimate the information of ETH. And this we have to do over a, a big block in order to have a good statistical security. And at some point, actually, it's not only the error rate of a detector which uh, limits us, but actually the time we want to spend before we can distill a key. And if the rates are very low, this time can be pumped by big. So if you fix your certain limit, this will also so limit, so a fix a certain limit of the distance you can achieve. Okay, so what are the errors we have here? Well, of course we have dark counts, but also no, you can have actually other contributions of, of the errors. And you see here, we measure very precisely the arrival time of the photon. So we have these time slots where we expect the photons to arrive. So here uh, at time t zero. And now, since if the timing resolution of the detector is not perfect, of course, this uh, detection will spread out a little bit, no? So we may have detections which go in this window side, which will just be, be loss, but it can also happen, uh, happen that they go in the next window and this will generate errors. So this means that we don't need only uh, low dark counts, but also low chip. You see here actually a simulation of how the quantum bit error rate increases if the jitter of the detectors increases. And we can uh, calculate the figure of merit of single photon detectors, which is actually, uh, you see this expression here, which is proportional to efficient, protection efficiency of the detector. Of course, that is important, but then divided by the dark count rate and this temporal jitter delta t. So that's something we, we must have, okay? Now, if you want to go really now to high rates, actually, if you look, come back to this curve here, and you look a bit closer what happens here at short distances, actually, in practice, we don't go up like this. So at some point, actually, our de detector saturate, no? So our repetition rate of our scheme is so fast that at short distances, the detectors cannot follow. And the limit we can achieve here, the maximum secret key rate depends on the uh, maximum count rate of the detectors. So the detectors must have low dark count, low jitter, and high count rate. 
And now Giovanni will show, tell you how, what the kind of detectors we developed, particularly for this uh, task. Thank you. So I stop my presentation and uh, Giovanni can take over. Yes. So I will, um, I will uh, focus on uh, superconducting nanowires, single photon detectors, as they are the best single photon detectors that are commercially available at telecom wavelengths. And SNSPDs have had already a profound impact in a variety of fields and have enabled several new technologies. And today we focus on their implementation in uh, experiments of quantum key distribution. So in their conventional form, a single pixel SNSPD is a long meander of superconducting material to which uh, light can be effe efficiently coupled via an optical fiber. The detector is biased at a specific current, uh, bias current IB, that is close to its critical current. Here is an example of a simple biasing and readout circuit that can be used. And uh, thanks to this bias current, uh, the absorption of a single photon in the nanowire is enough to trigger a resistive switch of the entire cross-section of the nanowire. Once this happens, the current that was flowing in the nanowire is diverted to the readout circuit. And here in the image, you can see an output pulse produced by this exact biasing circuit from a, for a single pixel detector. And of course, this pulse, this electrical pulse, is a signal of the detection of a single photo. Uh, once the current leaves the nanowire and it's diverted to the readout uh, circuit, the nanowire is time to cool down and is then able to detect a new incoming photo. So SNSPDs have achieved remarkable performances in terms of system detection efficiencies, in terms of dark count, and also in terms of jitter, which we have seen uh, from, uh, from the previous slides that are key parameters for achieving the best results in quantum key distribution. However, in their single pixel implementation, SNSPDs remain limited in terms of recovery time, which directly impacts their maximum achievable detection rate. And moreover, that is a feature that is not important for quantum key distribution, but it's becoming more and more desirable in several quantum optics applications. These single pixel SNSPDs have a limited photon number resolving capability. So at IE Quantique and the University of Geneva, we are exploring two approaches to develop always faster SNSPD while also enabling photon number resolving capabilities. We have developed parallel SNSPD, which we also refer to as P-SNSPD, where four to eight pixels are connected in parallel in one readout line. These detectors are able to count up to around 100 mega counts per second, and they also enable photon number resolving information so you can retrieve the information on the amount of photons arriving on the detector by the amplitude of the output pulse. Uh, we also developed multi-pixel SNSPDs, which we refer to as MP SNSPD. And these are composed by four to 16 pixels, which are independently biased and read out. This type of detector enables us to count above one giga counts per second, and also enable dynamic PNR, meaning that there is no limitation uh, on the input light that we send to the detectors. Here I focus mostly on NP SNSPD, but I will also show you how the P SNSPD made their way to the quantum uh, key distribution experiment. So here is, is a SEM image of the device that we fabricated. You can see there are 14 independent pixels, and once uh, it's a uh, um, wire bonded to the PCB and placed at 0 0.8 Kelvin, you can find the detector right in the middle of uh, the fiber sleeve, uh, perfectly coupled to the core of a single mode fiber. So the main, if you zoom in a little bit, we can find the main feature of the detectors. So as I've already mentioned, we have 14 interleaved pixels, which are arranged in this uh, interleaved geometry in order to guarantee a uniform uh, light distribution. The nanowires are much shorter than what a single pixel SNSPD would be like. And this allows for a much faster recovery time. And as I mentioned, the nanowires are biased and read out individually in order to achieve the highest count rate. 
For these detectors, we use NBTIM superconducting material, which also enables us to have the lowest jitter and low thermal cross-talk between these uh, neighboring wires. So we characterize the all 14 pixels in terms of their pixel detection efficiency. So here you can see the curves for, for these 14 detectors showing a very uniform uh, uh, pixel detection efficiency with an average value of 5.7% and uh, around the 10% plateau width, which allows us to, um, to bias the detector in a comfortable range of currents. And by summing up these single pixel efficiencies, we can project that this detector that we fabricate will have a maximum system detection efficiency of around 80%. We characterize the jitter of all the pixels, which we have heard it's a very important uh, metric and a very important parameter for QKD. So for these detectors, we achieve the jitter once deconvoluted, which means that we remove the intrinsic jitter of the laser and also the, of the TCSPC card that we use. We achieve the jitter, an average jitter full width of maximum of around 18.5 picosecond. And a very uniform distribution. Now, this jitter is measured at low count rate. So we have also studied how this jitter increases with uh, increasing count rate. And there are details about this and how this can be mitigated in, uh, in the paper we published. Um, the pixel recovery time, it's a very important metric as uh, it gives us uh, the real measurement of how the efficiency of a pixel will recover in time after a detection. So you can see if I have a detection at time zero, there is a very short amount of time for which the device, the one pixel cannot detect the photo. But as the current flows back into the nanowire, the efficiency can fast, very fastly recover. And we have that we reach back 90% of the maximum efficiency only, only, only after six nanoseconds after a detection. And this directly points to the possibility that these detectors have to achieve uh, ultra high detection rates. So now that the performances of each pixel have been carefully analyzed, we bias all the pixel at the same time and read them out all together to look at the performance of the entire array. And we do this by producing what we call a count rate curve for the full detector. So this curve shows how the system detection efficiency uh, changes as the detection rate of the array increases. So in this case, we measure this by sending CW light uh, so that the interarrival time between two consecutive photons is not fixed. And this is a really good uh, representation of what also happens to the detector in the QKD experiment because Alice sends state at 2.5 gigahertz. So it's almost as if uh, for the time scale of the detector, it's almost as if there was a CW laser. So from this measurement, we can see that we achieve, we measure a total system detection efficiency of 80%. We're able to keep this efficiency above 90% X maximum value up to 250 mega counts per second. And we achieve a maximum count rate, which is the count rate at half the maximum efficiency of 1.5 giga counts per second. The detectors operate in latch free mode, so we are even able to count at 2.5 giga counts per second, although the efficiency drops to, in this case, around 20%. So these are the results that were obtained from the detector that was used in the QKD experiment. And however, since then, we made further improvements to our MPS and SPD, and I'm thrilled to just give you a flavor of what these new results are. So we managed to improve the system detection efficiency up to a maximum of 90%, which also allows to keep to be able to count up to 400 mega counts per second while keeping this efficiency at 90% its original value. And moreover, we've also shown how this detector can, sh can uh, be used uh, for state reconstruction with light uh, that has a long pulse duration, which is a very interesting regime for several cavity enhanced single photon sources. And you can find more detail in our published work. So after this brief detour uh, to look at these exciting results, I will go back uh, to the iSpeed QKD experiment that was performed uh, at University of Geneva 
And this is the setup that Professor Zbinden has described. And we can see here, we have our multi-pixel SNSPD that is operating on the Z basis and our PSNSPD that's operating on the X basis in order to, to be able to announce if there is any eavesdropping in the quantum channel. So thanks to the unprecedented performances of our SNSPDs, we show a secret key rate exchange at 63.6 megabit per second over a distance of uh, 10 kilometer. And when increasing this distance to 100 kilometer, we are able to achieve a secret key rate of three megabits per second, which it's up to five times faster than the state of the art at the time of uh, publication of our work. So I believe that this result can show how SNSPD are able to enable novel applications and push the boundaries of optical quantum technologies. And uh, here at IDQ, we are thrilled to be able to offer our customers a complete family of SNSP de detectors that can fit any need. So feel free to reach out to us in case you want to discuss this further. And moreover, we're also excited because IDQ is in a privileged position as it's also one of the market leaders in the production and deployment of QKD system. So we're looking forward to bring our expertises together and integrate our state-of-the-art QKD system together with our SNSPD in order to enable future-proof quantum security with unprecedented performances. Uh, again, please do get in touch if you're interested in discussing any of this further. We will be delighted to answer any of your inquiries. Uh, with this, I want to thank the entire team at the uh, University of Geneva and the funding agency that have supported some of this work. And of course, I want to thank the team at ID Quantique for their amazing work and for hosting this webinar. Thank you all for listening and we'll be delighted to answer your questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Giovanni. Thank you, Go, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, for those who are interested, there's more information in the in the Nature Photonic uh, uh, publication that was highlighted by Giovanni just a few minutes ago. And for those who are going to be in Munich next week, um, uh, I'd like to, to tell you that Giovanni is going to be uh, presenting at Laser Worlds of Photonics in Munich next week uh, on Wednesday. There's more information on the uh, event page uh, or reach out to us if you want to, to meet. Uh, now we have some questions. Uh, so let me see. There's a few questions about uh, SNSPDs. There's one that that uh, that is asked. Somebody is asking, what is the benefit that is uh, that we're gaining at working at lower temperatures? So that that's one for you, Giovanni. I'm guessing. Yes. So SNSPDs are uh, the operating principle of SNSPDs is based on. Uh, uh, destroying a super, the superconductivity in this very thin field. So we are forced to operate below the transition temperature of a, of a superconducting field. So the lower the temperature, the more current you are able to push in the detectors and you can achieve slightly better performances. But in general, as a rule of thumb, you should operate SNSPDs at around uh, half the critical temperature of the film more or less. And there has been improvements uh, in, uh, you know, there's been a lot of research to try to develop superconducting materials that are able to, uh, that have a transition temperature maybe of uh, 70 Kelvin or even higher. And so they would be able to operate at higher temperatures. But for now, uh, all the commercial SNSPDs are operated at uh, between 0 0.8 and 2.5 Kelvin. Thank you. Uh, there's, there's another question on SC, NSP, SSPD. Um, there's a question about how do we achieve non-latching performance and more specifically on the MP SSPD uh, detectors? Yes, so what well, this is, uh, uh, this is done by the, the way we design our readout circuit that is placed at 40 Kelvin inside the, 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 um, the cryostat. So the idea for latching is that you never want too much current to go back too fast in the SNSPD, even if it's clicking uh, you know, a really high speed. 
So you need to carefully control that by designing the readout circuit and you can achieve this. All right. Uh, there's a question about uh, the, that's probably for you, uh, Hugo, is the kind of uh, sources that, that has been used in the, in the experiment and the, the need of single photon so, uh, sources uh, as well. Can you, can you comment on that? Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Well, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm sorry if I was not clear enough. So our single photon sources are just weak coherent pulses. And of course, the number of photons in this uh, coherent pulses is uh, Poisson distributed. So if you have an average photon number of typically 0 0.5 photons per pulse, then you have a quite high chance from time to time to have two photons, three photons, and so on. That's why we use this uh, decoy method in order to prevent that the eavesdrop takes advantage of this. But this makes, of course, the source very simple. So it's just a, a, a very standard uh, pulsed laser diode. We attenuate appropriately, uh, a prop, you know, appropriate way to, to achieve this uh, value. So in average, uh, less than one photon per pulse. And I have seen there was another question also about if uh, shaping of uh, pulse can improve uh, 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 performance and uh, about single photon purity. So in our case, the shape of a pulse is not so important. It's, it's, uh, it's important in order to, to reduce uh, as much as possible the uh, chromatic dispersion we have in the fiber. So that's why we use a filter actually to, to, to get an, a more or less Gaussian shape. But uh, the purity in, in some sense is, is bad as a single photon source because it's not a single photon source. So it's, it's a different issue if you want to really work with uh, single photon sources or rectangle photon sources where a purity of the makes it indeed uh, is important. In our case, this is not important. Thank you. Uh, there's, we've got quite a lot of questions, so I'm afraid we won't be able to, to take all the questions live and we will answer all these questions offline. So don't, don't be uh, disappointed if, you're, if your question is not answered uh, live. There's, there's questions about SNSPD design. Can we make large areas and free space uh, optics compatible with SNSPDs? Yes. This is, a, this is a very interesting question. Um, the short answer is that we can, because, uh, I mean, the limitation there is the fabrication process. So it's basically, can you get a uniform uh, enough superconducting material over this large area? Can you pattern it properly? And uh, from the, our results, we believe that we can. We have made, uh, again, in collaboration with the University of Geneva, some devices that were um, up to 80 micron in diameter. So maybe you could take this device as a, your unit pixel and you replicate it around and then you end up with a very large, even multi-pixel device. So I think it is possible, then you will need to kind of figure out how to efficiently couple the light in a cryostat. You'll need to develop some optical filters, some lenses, align the, 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 the light on the detector. But in principle, this is, uh, this is possible. Just on, on the same topic, uh, talking about seeing, uh, SNSPDs, how do, we, uh, how do we measure the quantum efficiency uh, in, in general and, and more specifically for each pixel? So uh, how do we yeah. do this okay. and you elaborate on that? Yes, of course. So the, the idea is that the, the light is uniformly distributed on the array. So each pixel, as will uh, receive a certain percentage of this light. So if when I say that a pixel has a 5% efficiency, it's not a very bad pixel that has a low efficiency. It's a very good pixel that is receiving a little bit less light because it's sharing the area with all the other pixels. Uh, the way we measure this is actually quite easy. So because these, the, these nanowires are, each pixel can be addressed individually. We can perform this measurement by biasing only one detector, sending light everywhere. And then you do the usual thing. So you measure the photo count rate. So how many 
detections you have because of photons, you subtract the dark count rate, which you measure with the light with the laser off, and then you divide this number by the your uh, estimation of the number of photons that you were sending. So of course you need that to attenuate the laser. You need to very carefully um, with a power meter understand how much each attenuator is attenuating in order to have uh, an accurate estimate of the amount of photons that you are sending. And usually there is uh, an error on these numbers that depends mainly on the accuracy of your power meter. So usually an efficiency measurement will have between uh, one and 5% error, depending mostly on the accuracy of your power meter. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, a question about polarization, uh, and and um, you know, is is there is is it possible to have uh, SNSPD that are independent or polarization independent? I should I should ask. The, there is a, there is a possibility. It's actually a product that uh, we do offer. Um, so the idea is to make a design where there is no preferential polarization. So you can make something in a spiral. So you can have a single pixel that instead of being a meander is kind of a spiral. And then you have slightly lower maximum efficiency, but you manage to have very little polarization dependence. Good. Um, just looking, take one more question. I don't know, Hugo, if you saw a question that you wanted to take. Well, um, there is. There are a few I can uh, maybe reply quickly. There was a question about the uh, twin field technology commercialization status. Uh, to my uh, knowledge, there is, it's still far away from, from a commercial uh, application. Somebody asked how this result compares to the uh, recent results by a Chinese group uh, claiming that they have 100 megabits per second. Uh, well, it's it's uh, very, very comparable, these two experiments. Indeed, the, the Chinese group had even a bit better uh, uh, results, but the setups are very, very, very similar. They have the same clock rate, uh, very, very little differences. Um, well, well, have you tested free space QKD instead of fiber as quantum channel? Well, we made very, very basic experiments, but there are a couple of groups who make that uh, quite routinely uh, uh, over distances up to maybe 10, a few kilometers. And there, of course, there are these quite uh, famous uh, experiments with satellites where you, the Chinese group managed to make some key exchange between satellite and an earth station with very low rates and big errors, but still, the, Kind of a proof of principle, which is was a very nice experiment. Well, Good. there are many, many of questions. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, we will take we'll take those uh, offline. Uh, um, okay, so I think we we can we can stop here. Uh, there's going to be a poll uh, just in a few seconds. But before we we stop this uh, webinar, I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Yuga and Giovanni, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, this uh, this was very uh, very well presented. Um, so please enter your your feedback in the poll that is now uh, currently available. I'd like also to remind you that we we do these kind of webinars on a regular basis. So please uh, look at our website and stay um, uh, and, and look for more webinars because again we we do that on a on a regular basis. Uh, this webinar is going to be available for um, to to um, to view again if you have if you missed it or if you want to look at it uh, again, and and finally for those of you uh, who wants to get a copy of the slides, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to request uh, a, a copy. We'll be happy to provide it uh, to you by email. Uh, so with this, I'd like to. I'd like to end uh, this webinar and thank you again to the presenters. And uh, I'd like to I'd like to thank everybody who joined us uh, this afternoon for this uh, webinar. So goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.